Hello, I'm Rebecca Lewington. Welcome to our podcast. Micron recently announced that we're shipping memory chips built using the world's most advanced DRAM process technology, which offers major improvements in bit density, power, and performance. This is an astonishing feat of nanofabrication, which I'm ill-equipped to talk about. But T. Tran, whose global team has driven what we call our one alpha technology from pathfinding to high volume manufacturing, absolutely is. So T, thanks so much for joining me. Hello. <laughs> First, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your, what's your, what's your background and what's your current role? Okay, well, thank you, Rebecca, for the opportunity. Um, I am an electrical engineer by trade and have been riding this amazing semiconductor adventure for over 26 years. I've worked in the US, Europe, and Asia and have done two fab startups. So currently as the VP of DRAM process integration, I'm leading the efforts to drive the next generation DRAM technology development, including disruptive pathfinding efforts uh, to set the strategy for Micron's future DRAM roadmaps. And my global team also covers uh, technology transfer into high volume manufacturing plants. Wow, that is a serious job. So first of all, tell us what does one alpha mean? So one alpha is basically a nomenclature for a technology node, which is typically defined as the smallest feature size on a chip. And for DRAM particularly, it is usually the dimension of half of the pitch of the active area in the memory cell. And for one alpha, uh, you can think of it as a fourth generation of the, what we call 10 nanometer class, where this active uh, area half pitch ranges from 10 to 19 nanometers. So as we go from one X to one Y, one Z, and then one alpha, this dimension then gets smaller and smaller. And this active area uh, shrink uh, or scaling as we call it, is also defined by the uh, word line and the bit line pitches in the cell. So then it allows us to squeeze more memory cells in the die as we shrink uh, all of these dimensions. And how Got aggressive it. we scale the memory technology, um, uh, the memory cell area is uh, one of the key knobs for increasing the uh, memory bit density, um, which also allows you to uh, reduce the cost uh, of the DRAM node over node. And um, by optimizing uh, for electrical parameters um, in the memory array and other areas of the circuit uh, with process and design innovations, we can also uh, provide power and performance advancements. Right. Now, let me dig in a little bit to a couple of things you said, which I'm not sure everyone will understand. What do you mean by pitch? And what do you mean by active area? Um, pitch is basically defined by the line and space uh, of a, a feature, um, or, or if you have a contact a layer, a hole a layer, then it's basically the you know the um, edge of that hole uh, to the next um, edge of the, the neighboring hole. Right. So you can kind of think of it as the smallest distance on the smallest thing yes. on the wafer. Gotcha. Correct. And the active area. Uh, the active area, that is where the, um, basically the transistor of the DRAM capacitor, particularly that we're talking about in the memory cell array, um, that is the area in the silicon um, where we um, make the connection of the transistor to the silicon um, channel um, for the uh, transistor of the DRAM memory cell. So at a very simple level, you're making like a like a checkerboard with more and more and more squares, but the checkerboard size doesn't change. The actual size of the board doesn't change so that the squares get smaller. Correct. Yeah. And and the active area is the part where it, you know, you're elect you can be electrically active um, when the device turns on, uh, as opposed to the isolation area where we, you know, uh, or what we call um, STI region um, is the inverse of that pattern. Right. Gotcha. So Help us understand, help us visualize just how small is this memory cell now? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, for perspective, uh, imagine if one die is about the size of my little fingernail here. Um, and if you upsize that to a soccer field as an analogy, um, if you pull out one bit blade of uh, grass, um, you snip it in half and in half and in half again, um, that's basically the size of your one memory cell. So it's super tiny relative to that huge soccer field. Wow, I've been I've been in this business for 
longer than I care to think about. And I still find this really hard to comprehend. It's just amazing. Anyway, um, I gather a critical part of the manufacturing process is advanced lithography. Um, what's lithography and why is what's so advanced about it? So um, basically, it's the capability for us to uh, ideally uh, uniformly define the patterns of either the memory cell array or circuit patterns in the other areas of the die. Um, and um, it is our key element to ensure um, that we have a good process robustness, high yields, and good performance and reliability. Um, so basically, um, any deviations or abnormalities in these patterns could cause defect uh, or DPM level fails or defects per million level fails in the field. So um, our advanced patterning methods uh, utilizes state-of-the-art lithography or photolithography uh, methods, uh, as well as photo mask technology. And uh, we use it not only to multiply the pitches for these uh, patterns or layers, uh, but also to form the smallest feature sites. Um, and um, it is, we also do that to perfect the alignment of one uh, layer to the next layer. So that as you build from a 3D dimension, as you go um, up from the silicon level, you're able to have a um, you know, good overlay of one um, layer to the previous layer. Right, because or, if the circuit yeah. features aren't perfect, then the rest of it's a waste of time if the actual features aren't the right shape and size to start with. Right, yes, and it could cause a, a failure of the chip either, um, you know, from a, um, you know, uh, what we can describe, you know, what we call yield um, before it gets to the customer, or in some cases, um, if it's a degradation uh, failure mechanism, it could fail at the customer, so we definitely don't want that. No, that would be bad. So tell me a bit more about this pitch doubling or notion you were talking about, or pitch multiplication. What does that mean? So, um, you know, as, as basically, you know, let me back off just, uh, you know, with respect to the lithography itself, and then I can walk through the pitch multiplication. So lithography, you know, it's similar to these, uh, if you imagine pre-digital photography process where uh, light is shined through, um, you know, a small transparent version of photography onto light sensitive paper, um, except in this case, uh, we're shining deep ultraviolet light um, at a certain wavelength through a pattern that is uh, laid down uh, on um, a square or rectangular piece of quartz um, that we call a photo mass. Um, so it's kind of like stenciling, um, but so you're letting light through. And, um, you know, without going too, too uh, deep into the details um, um, of the, um, you know, resolution limits and so on. But for example, um, you know, the numerical aperture, kind of like in your camera uh, that you have. Um, so when you have a, a, a numerical aperture, like on the order of 1.35 for our, you know, uh, immersion tools, for example, in lithography, that uses this 193 nanometer wavelength. Um, we typically, you know, the equation comes out to be about 36 nanometer. Well, how can you do, how can you pattern something that is in the, you know, 10 nanometer range um, uh, or, you know, 10 to 20 nanometer range as we discuss. Um, so you have to be creative in terms of uh, deploying other uh, process technologies to basically multiply that pitch. Um, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive because you're actually shrinking that pitch. Um, so the, the, the distance between, you know, the line and, and the next line. Um, so we basically, uh, we enable this by, um, you know, starting with a more relaxed uh, pattern. We use um, what we call a deposition and a film deposition process to deposit over the lithography, the, the, the masking or the resist pattern, we call it. Um, and then we etch through that spacer and the, that spacer itself then can become, you know, the, the space between the spacers can then become the next um, pattern that, that we, um, it's kind of like a, we call it a hard mask. Um, so then you're able to um, basically double that uh, pitch or, you know, we call it um, pitch quadrupling or multiply that pitch by two, by, by four, for example, uh, simply by using the spacers to um, then become the, the, 
the new um, resist mass um, replacement, so to speak. That's amazing. It's a brilliant trick, turning one thing into four things just by- It's magic. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> magic. <laughs> Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, it's it's like, uh, you know, like, but, you know, if, if you didn't have that, it's like um, trying to write a 10-point text using a four-inch uh, paintbrush, right? So, yeah, yes, have you'd to have, have to be very good at it and probably not do it the same twice. Exactly. So moving on beyond patterning, beyond lithography, what were some of the other challenges you had to solve? It sounds like you overhauled almost every single part of the manufacturing process to make this work. Would that be fair to say? <laughs> Uh, yes, from from the technology process point, design point, um, uh, you know, we, we have aggressive um, shrinks uh, and so on and, and new technology and process vectors. Um, we also, yes, uh, absolutely. We, um, we basically um, put all the bells and whistles that we can, uh, so to speak, uh, to make this, uh, to get it out faster into the market um, and, and also uh, basically to offer uh, performance and, and power advantages. Excellent, which leads me to my next question. Making one of these in the lab is one thing, but you have to do it in high volume manufacturing, which means billions and billions and trillions of transistors every year. How do you do that? How do you make everything exactly the same every time? And how do you ramp up from one to billions? Right, so, um, you know, from, from the actual um, producing part of it, my manufacturing colleagues uh, would probably uh, be you know the better experts for that um, but with respect to the technology development and the process design points uh, we basically um, you know always leverage uh, previous lessons learned uh, from prior nodes um, the, the last few nodes for example we leverage um, the capability of new tool and processes from vendors and also our in-house, um, you know, uh, homebrew uh, type of uh, innovations to uh, basically set the process to um, have a, a strong sweet spot, but also sufficient uh, variation, um, you know, capability to, to allow for something that can be can tolerate that variation in a high volume manufacturing fab and if you you know uh, from the statistics standpoint uh, just think about you know you know if you have to um, compound you know, you know 20 steps right each of them each unit process have, have their own variation so we have complex 3d modeling tools to predict uh, you know uh, defects per million failure rates we not only do um, we're beyond the, the, the 2D calculations, um, you know, back of the envelope calculations for process margins, we're deep, deeply uh, into, you know, um, even electrical models, structural influences, and predicting failure rates based on our empirical data from prior nodes. So, you know, designing for manufacturability from a process margin predicting the connection between structural variation to electrical consequences, and also, you know, collaborating very closely with our design and product engineering teams to basically have a holistic view of um, optimizing for the trade-offs, you know, uh, to get the best uh, yield, uh, basically mainly, which means, you know, getting more good dye out to the customers. Uh, which then also reduces our costs as well for a given wafer and um, optimizing um, for, you know, for not only for yield, but for reliability performance. That's our triangle, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, optimizing cost performance and then power and so on um, is, um, is our bread and butter. And, uh, you know, having done this for 26 years, I, I mean, DRAM is it's it's so simple as a you know as a circuit um, you know structure, but it's uh, so many nuances in terms of the intricacies of, of one layer to another, one module to another, the interactions between the array and the the peripheral circuit is uh, you know just it's it's magic and it's um, I love it more today than I did my first day of my job, so love it. Oh, if you say it's magic, then there's no way I'm, I'm ever going to properly wrap my head around it. Um, I gather you 
you, the team, the thousands and thousands of people who worked on this, you managed to actually bring this node from lab to fab in record time. How was that achieved? Yeah, so we, um, uh, you know, not to say that we didn't have our, our rough um, challenges and many obstacles ahead. Um, you know, we took a different approach. This was the first node where we, uh, it's our first uh, product or um, the, the child that came from this, uh, what we call our, um, you know, collaborative efforts between our, uh, it's a forum we have with um, design, uh, product engineering and technology development. Um, and we also get inputs from manufacturing as well. But um, how we collaborated, we, um, we went for we went for the gold, so to speak, um, and we made very risky decisions very early in the program. Then we went about to um, define the uh, projects, the vehicles to um, mitigate these risks, uh, rather than the other way around, where we were much more conservative before and just uh, basically wait uh, for the data to be proven. Um, then make the decision. So here we apply our engineering know-how, you know, our innovation prowess, bet on it, you know, uh, test it, validate the risk, uh, in, you know, later. Um, but that sets the direction and it drives the pressure and it drives our execution so that we, you know, we go for the gold instead of settling for the bronze or silver. Brilliant, brilliant. It's almost like you've uh, decided to ask for forgiveness, not permission for trying new things. Uh, exactly. And, and we, we, you know, our, um, you know, leadership team uh, also um, enabled us with the, you know, the uh, resources in terms of new tools and process capabilities as well. So right, um, right. You know, we were willing to spend for it. So it's worth it. <laughs> they gave up. you the toys and they gave you the permission to go out there and on a limb and do, do something new and do something good. That's Lots brilliant. of toys. <laughs> so just, just to finish off, T, what's next for you? So um, for me, particularly, um, you know, there we, we are all constantly, we've already, while we're deploying the you know, uh, this node, um, you know, it's already in manufacturing. We have are already in parallel, have our other teams uh, onto uh, the next, you know, uh, if, if we, I were to call this uh, node N, uh, you know, we already have teams working on N plus, um, you know, three, four, uh, so on. So um, my team works on future nodes and also scopes out for um, disruptive, um, opportunities to set the strategy for, you know, even further out nodes. Um, but uh, also we, um, for me particularly, um, having worked so closely with manu our manufacturing partners, um, we're also going aggressively to um, basically uh, attack um, from the cost reduction perspective um, after deployment uh, to basically get, you know, to squeeze every bit out of these nodes um, and also figure out ways to offer more um, product um, on this node to widen our portfolio uh, to deliver a broad, um, you know, uh, choices for our customers. Awesome. Well, I can see that means we're going to get to have this chat about once a year. So I look forward to the next one. T, thank you so much for joining me. This has been absolutely fascinating and I wish you the very best. It's my absolute pleasure. I'd love to talk about DRAM anytime, any day. <laughs>